Right now, someone somewhere could be giving you a score. A number that estimates how likely you are to break the law. Which tells police if they should zero in on you. And which could forever change your life and the lives of those around you. It, it destroyed everything. And this someone might not be a human being, but a computer. So how do machines try to predict crime? And is it okay to do that? From DW, this is Techtopia. And in this episode, we're investigating how police use technology to predict where crimes will take place and who will commit them. We hear from officials about why they use the systems. From experts who issue dire warnings. They do embed a lot of historical discrimination. And we explain how the programs attempt to forecast the future. And if that sounds like science fiction to you, well, listen to this. I feel like I just got a stamp on my head with he's a criminal, watch out. This is Damien. When he was 14 years old, software flagged him to local police as a future criminal. So I committed a street robbery, and the reason I was put on the list was that I committed another one on my probation. My name is Damien Sarju, and uh, I live in Amsterdam. I was hanging with the wrong people, but, you know, I didn't care. I didn't think of the consequences. So Damien did break the law, but he says that what happened after his conviction made it hard for him to get back on the right path. What would have helped me is someone who understood what I was going through. I don't think a computer system is human enough to decide if you are going on the list or not. That's how it all started. After Damien was convicted for the two robberies, a computer program estimated that he was likely to break the law again. That's why authorities put him on a watch list called Top 600, and they kept him on there after he had served his sentence. They actually didn't tell me what it meant. They were just like, uh, I got an own sort of detective. And he tell me that if I would commit any crime from that moment, um, he will be the first face I'll see in the morning when they come to pick me up to arrest me. I got ID'd all the time uh, for no reason. You know, you could be trying your best to be not a criminal and they would point you at the smallest thing you do. What are you doing in this neighborhood? I did feel trapped. I did feel like I was put in a box with the Top 600 logo on it and just put away. I didn't see a way out. And being on the list wouldn't only have an impact on Damien's life. It would also bring his brother, who had no criminal record, into conflict with the police and it would eventually lead his mother to take on the entire system. Confused? No worries, we'll get to the bottom of that. But first, let's start by looking into how the technology works. At its heart, there's a big promise to stop crime before it's even committed. This is done by combing through masses of data. Some programs focus on potential crime scenes. If they find links between previous incidents, say that they all occurred at a certain time and place, or even during the same weather conditions, they recommend that police zero in on those locations. Other programs predict what they consider to be potential offenders. They scan the criminal and personal histories of individuals for risk factors, such as who was arrested and how often, or even who dropped out of school, and come up with a list of who's likely to break the law. But how common is it for police to use those systems? Well, it's actually more common than you might think. Over the last decade, the use of predictive policing has spread all around the world. Police in over 50 countries, from Western democracies like France to authoritarian nations like China, now deploy the programs. This has given rise to a multi-billion dollar industry 
with companies from small startups to big corporations working on the programs. But those companies only build the software. The decision to use it is made by policymakers, often together with law enforcement. And we wanted to find out why. In 2011, the then new mayor, Eberhard van der Laan, took office. And in uh, that period of time, Amsterdam had to deal with a lot of armed robberies and violence out in the streets. And that caused great worries to us and also to the inhabitants of Amsterdam. My name is Herman Bolhar. I am the National Rapporteur on Human Trafficking and Sexual Abuse of Children. In 2011, I was the Chief Prosecutor in Amsterdam. We talked about new ways of dealing with these problems and then the idea of focusing on the, the hard core of offenders came up and then the idea of the top 600 was born. We got together and came to the conclusion that we should do more to analyze what was really going on and try to see what we could do to be more preventative. Because if you prevent it from happening, then the, uh, there are no victims and no perpetrators, right? Over a decade later, the top 600 is still up and running, along with a second list called top 400, which was introduced in 2015. Well, the top 400 is the little brother of the top 600. My name is Martin Schippers. I'm the chief information officer of the public uh, order and safety department of the city of Amsterdam. Top 600 are, 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 are proven criminals. Top 400 are those at high risk at getting in that direction. To recap, the city of Amsterdam now has two lists. One that's called top 600 for those who've already been convicted of crimes. And a second one called top 400 for teenagers deemed likely to become criminals. For example, in the top 600, you would have to be uh, arrested for high impact crimes a couple of times in the last couple of years. If the software finds that a person has also been convicted more than once, it recommends putting them on the top 600. For the top 400, the software is looking at more than just the criminal records of teenagers, checking also if they have a history of domestic abuse, if they have serious problems at school, or if they've ever been on the radar of youth care. These are all criteria, so say from 1 to 10, and you have to fit, say, at least 7. And then, then you will be put on the top 400 or top 600 list. The aim is on, on the one side solving a societal problem, solving a safety problem, making the city safer, but also trying to create a, a little bit of a better life for a portion of our population that never really had the chances or the opportunities. That's the strategy behind the programs in Amsterdam. First, use technology to identify those most at risk of breaking the law, and then boost both strict oversight by police, as well as support by social workers to prevent them from committing crimes. So much for the theory. Now, the question is, does it work? When Damien was 14, I heard of the top 600 list, but it didn't say much to me. I just read about it, that it would help your son to get back on track. Uh, my name is Diana Sarju and I'm the mother of Damien. It didn't work out for us as well as we thought. It, it destroyed everything. And we're not a family anymore. It destroyed us, it pulls us apart. They put his uh, older brother, he's one year older, on the list in four, 400, just out of yeah, precaution, because they say from, yeah, if one of the kids is on the 600, the most likely will influence the other kids in the family. It's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. You know, you put him on the list, he's not a criminal yet, but he will get there. So they labeled him, and because of that, he thinks, okay, is that what they think from me? And I will act that way. What Diana says about her two sons here sums up the core controversy over predictive policing. Ask supporters and they tell you that the technology can help build a society where crime is nipped in the bud. 
But opponents say the systems do the opposite, and often target the most vulnerable members of society, pushing them even further to the edges. The programs, for instance, often flag low-income communities or minority neighborhoods as alleged hotspots, prompting the police to patrol those areas more than others. This in turn generates even more data and sets off a vicious circle of discrimination, flagging these areas over and over again. Similarly, the programs tend to single out low-income people and minorities as potential offenders. But why is that? Why do computers replicate the kind of biases we know from the analog world? Existing police data, whether in New Delhi, whether in the US, whether in Germany, whether in Australia, embed a lot of historical discrimination. Um, they do embed systemic problems such as racism or casteism or even sexism. Now we're taking all of this data that is you know, seemingly objective and correct, but is in reality quite biased and discriminatory, especially towards minority populations. We take that as being the ground truth on which the computer kind of like learns what patterns exist. You know, I always learned one thing in school. The computer doesn't make mistakes, people do. It's what you put in it that will come out. And years later, and I'm now, older and somehow that came to mind again I said yeah but if they put wrong data feed the computer wrong data then we get a we get a whole thing that isn't right you need to take care of poverty good education and equal chances her criticism is that with this program you are fighting the symptoms rather than the root cause of crime? Maybe, yeah, sometimes. Every case of the 600 is very different and with some you can only fight the symptoms. But with some you don't even get to the symptoms. You know, sometimes you just really don't get far at all. Uh, and sometimes you get closer, you can get deeper and you can actually help with the root causes. So who's right? The city officials who say that their program helps prevent crime or Damien's mother Diana who says that it does the opposite? Well, Let's take a look at what the research says. Does predictive policing work? We don't know. We don't know. Well, we did a, um, a broad literature review of, uh, of uh, publications uh, about predictive policing to investigate to what extent we know whether predictive policing works, but also to what extent it results in adverse effects. But what we found out is that there is actually very little empirical evidence. Um, it's more ideological than empirically based. The interesting thing is that predictive policing is introduced so widely as if it would be very effective, whereas we argue that there really is no strong basis for this assertion. But as public awareness for the risks of predictive policing is growing, we've identified two trends in our investigation. One is that after a series of police killings ignited a debate over systemic racism and how to reform policing in the US, police departments from Santa Cruz to Los Angeles abandoned their predictive policing efforts. Which raises the question, could that pushback, that first trend, be a global trend? I would want to say yes, but unfortunately my answer is very much a no. In countries that don't have strong data protection legislation or you know where governments are more open to experimenting with technologies on people, we see that predictive policing is actually on the rise. The second trend we've noticed is that many companies have moved away from forecasting who will commit crimes to where they will take place. This, they say, makes their systems less prone to discrimination. But are they? No, they are just as prone to discrimination. So place-based predictive policing systems essentially take a bunch of data, whether that can be historical arrest data or how many people rent in a given neighborhood, how close you are to um, drug counseling centers, and use all that input to guess where they think crime will happen. And what's been found time and time again is that it simply sends police to the various places that they've already policed in the past. So if experts tell us that predictive policing is prone to discrimination, then what does the law say about its use? 
governments are deploying tools without any sort of law in place to allow individuals that are affected by those technologies to have appropriate remedies. There needs to be more exposure about what tools are being used, but there also need to be avenues for challenging not only the decisions that are being made by those computers, but also in certain instances, having a opportunity to abandon the use of the technology entirely. In 2020, Damien's hometown of Amsterdam introduced an online registry where it lists all algorithms used by its public administration. We want to show people this is what we do. So if you're on the top 600, you can always in that register very simply look up what it is that we did with your data and how we came to the conclusion to put you on the list or not. And speaking of Damien, did he ever get off that list? I did get off the list. It took me three years. You broke the law. Weren't you just paying a fair price for that? Yeah, I think I already paid my price when I got sentenced for you know the things I've done. I've got my house arrest, my uh, evening clock. <laughs> you know, um, I even had some fines. I think that, or I know that I already learned my lesson from that. I expected my mom to turn her back on me because, you know, I felt like I was the black sheep. What I did was the worst and could not be forgiven, but she actually stood aside me. I was the first mother who, who stepped out in public mm -hmm. in the newspaper, full name, full face and told about my experience on the top of 600 list. I was the only one who was speaking up because the other ones were afraid to speak up. I think it helped also that I went public, that he got off the list. And when Diana realized that there were many other families like hers, she decided to take her fight to the next level and set up a foundation. I started at my kitchen table, you know, I, I, I got money together. In the beginning, nobody would listen to me. But here, after three years, I'm still here. <laughs> and I'm helping mothers all over the country now. But things are changing, slowly, but they're changing, step by step. And yet, police departments around the world continue to use software to predict crimes and who will commit them. Which brings us back to our key question. When is it okay to use predictive policing? It has to be clear how the police makes certain choices about, uh, about the allocation of its resources. We need to know what kind of data are being used by these algorithms, what kind of rules are being coded in these algorithms. And we have to ensure that the police does not work in a discriminatory manner. Predictive policing should never be used. It has been shown time and time again to be discriminatory. Technology is not always the answer to problems. Sometimes the answer doesn't lie in technology, but maybe in rethinking institutions, in rebuilding institutions, in figuring out where institutions have gone wrong. Predictive policing, our investigation showed us, remains one of the most controversial technologies of our time. Whether or not to use it is up to lawmakers to decide. But all experts we talked to agreed that if they decide to use it, clear rules are needed. And it's time to debate how those rules should look like. Unlike the early systems, like the one that flagged Damien, newer ones make it increasingly difficult or even impossible to understand how exactly they come up with their predictions. Predictions that, as we've seen, can have life-altering consequences. And when it comes to decisions like that, what do you think? Should a machine have the last word?